as as, as Peter said, that is precisely what what this paper is attempting to do: um, finding a way to to find causal information from data. Um, that would be, if you could do that, that would be amazing, right? Imagine you, you wouldn't need any eggheads like Einstein or Newton anymore. You would just take massive amounts of data and just find the laws of everything, at least in some very good approximation. Um, question is, is, is that actually possible? Um, in the, when, when we talk about these structural models, typically we have an idea of, of a graph uh, that, that shows a causal dependency. And this graph has to be, in, in, at least in the, in the generic framework, has to be acyclic. So the graph on the left, you see is this X causes Y causes Z, but also Y has an impact on Z, would be an acyclic graph. There's no cycle if you follow any of the arrows. The graph on the right-hand side is, is not like that, right? So X goes to Y goes to Z, goes back to X. So, so this is a kind of graph we don't want to consider in any of these um, structural problems. Now, the, the, there's also an interesting relationship between structural graphs and, and, and the, the math in which, which you can describe such a problem. Uh, for example, the, the linear case can, can be written as a, a sort of matrix equation where certain values of, of the node uh, depend on some linear combination of, of other nodes, but these nodes are their parents. And typically there's some noise thrown in just to make things a bit more difficult. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's mathematically can can be spelled out like that. What is quite quite interesting is that this is not necessarily a solvable problem. On, on if, if you think about it, um, Purple did this. He showed that actually, what the only thing you really can do is, if you if you have a graph, you can test certain relationships. Namely, the, the graph makes certain predictions that certain uh, nodes should be independent given you control for, for the, the, the correct parents or, or you don't control for them, that there are certain different cases. However, it, it's also quite clear that there are different graphs that can have the same mathematical patterns emerging. And this is generally called a Markov equivalence class. And actually, already the, the very, very common case of, of these three graphs, so, so you have X and Z being, being caused by the same parent, Y or Z causing Y causing X or X causing Y causing Z are mathematically important to, to, to decipher by looking at the graphs because they create the same equivalence relation, uh, the, the same independence relationships. So hypothetically, the, the best thing you can do is actually find this equivalence class, but you probably can't from, from looking at data alone, find out where in this equivalence class your, your model actually is. So I, I think that is quite clear from, or that it has become quite clear in, in, in a lot of products that people nowadays actually start involving experts more, that, that most of these algorithms are there to find potential relationships. However, at the end of the day, to, to choose between the correct graph within any of these equivalence classes, you need additional information, either by experts who know that one way is much more likely than the other, or by, by experiments, right? So you, you might be able to run experiments that, that interact with say Y and, and then test how that changes X and Z. And that would tell you in, a, in another way that, that one of these is actually the, the right one rather than any of them. Um, how does it look? Or why, why, one reason why it is difficult to do mathematically is if you just take a very simple model of X and Y dependent on each other, and you could have, um, the case that the, the second variable x2 depends on x1, but mathematically that's completely equivalent to the, the, the formula x1 depending on x2, right? And the only difference is that uh, mathematically that the, that the uh, correlation coefficient would be different. And so um, the, it, it becomes very, very difficult to actually see mathematically, or it, one should expect that it's very, very difficult to, to find actually um, causal structure unambiguously in the data. Um, how, how does the, the setup typically, or how is the setup typically for these kind of problems? So you have a big matrix of data, which is the, the size n cos d. D is the number of nodes you have. So, so d this is an important number for this problem, it essentially tells you the size of the problem, how, how many nodes 
you have and if you imagine each node can potentially be connected to each other node so they are in principle d square possible edges roughly and you have typically n observations uh, and, and you, you expect that these n observations are independent of each other so that you essentially sample from this graph and in actually some of the papers this paper is referring to they actually a bit more, more precise about the setup so, so there has to be the data overall actually has to be typically Gaussian distributed um, but there are typically very few assumptions about the specific type of noise and what we're trying to find is this, this weight w which is essentially what we saw in the structural equations where uh, which tells us which um, nodes are connected to other ones in a causal relationship and um, actually what, what i forgot to say for these structural equations so, so structural equations can be very very similar but what what actually like steps kind of outside of the mathematics is in which direction uh, in which order are you evaluating them right so so causality implies an order in which you evaluate equations and so that is the thing that typically gets lost in, in these kind of experiments um are there any questions because i see there's something in the chat um, uh, do you have to exclude the identity as a solution uh, alexander do, do you want to uh, elaborate what what do you mean like like having no um no no relationship um I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what, what you mean the identity of, of of what i think he means like an identity matrix describing your adjacency matrix so um, um no generally that that i think it would not be allowed because typically on the, on the adjacency matrix you actually have to have the condition that you can't be adjacent to yourself so so there is no 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 no, no self uh self screening yeah Cool. That's fair. I guess based on the like the descriptions that they have of acyclic acyclicity, yeah. uh, like not having cycles, uh, the identity matrix would um, would have cycles, mm -hmm. and so it's it can't be any, a solution. Yeah, if if, if, you, if you consider itself following a cycle, yeah, that definitely you're right. Yeah. Now, what what was really interesting, and that took me quite a while to wrap my head around, is that. Typically, you have this, this sort of relationship fulfilled that X, so, so your, your data matrix is a function of itself multiplied by this, this weight matrix. And uh, it should be identical in the noiseless case. And that is quite interesting, right? Because on the right hand side, you have a single, um, a, a single matrix multiplication. And if, if you think about your, your cause, causal structures, right? your causal structures can actually be much deeper than, than a single evaluation. So that actually means it's not, it's, it's actually more a consistency relationship that, that once you have data that, that fulfills your causal graph, you would expect such a relationship to hold. However, it's, it's not a generator, with which I at, at first thought that's the case. It's, it's, it's not a generating relationship. Um, so uh, any, any questions? And um, they, they make heavy use of that relationship that you would expect in a, um, in a um, how do you say, uh, balanced or once X is, is self-consistent, you would sort of expect such a relationship. And in fact, that is actually what's used to train these kind of models. You, you have this, this score, which essentially tells you, given a, a matrix W and, and the data X can is this consistency relationship, namely that the, the right hand side, so that a, a, a node depends only on its parents, is fulfilled for different values of, of W, where W is again the adjacency matrix that should tell you which are the parents. Another thing in the chat. Yeah, fine. Oops. And, and what is actually the, the norm that is being, being optimized here? That is the Frobenius norm, which essentially. This is a sum over the absolute values of each um, of each uh, matrix entry uh, squared, so that naturally over and under prediction of, of these kind of things, you you you, you um, treat similarly. 
And, and so the idea is that from another paper that if you minimize this, you should actually fall in the right Markov equivalence class. That is, that is actually where, where they have a, a relatively solid proof. Again, it's a Markov equivalence class. So, so you wouldn't find the exact causal structure from it. You can only find the, the generic group in which you would be sitting in terms of uh, causal structure, which is, I think, quite an important distinction, which in this paper, I think they didn't make. They didn't, they, 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 they sort of referenced that paper, but, but didn't go into the exact um, caveats of, of this, this sort of approach. And in practice, actually, what they did is they enforced uh, another penalty, uh, a sparsity penalty on, on, on W, which makes, uh, is supposed to make, make W sparse. And there, there are several reasons for that. For example, this is this first um, relationship that X minus XW, um, you know, goes to the right equivalence class, I think technically only works for sparse matrices. Why? Because and we see that later that if, if it was not sparse, you could have these, these parent grandparent relationships essentially. And grandparent relationships would also cause correlations in your data that, however, are not directly causal. However, if you make your, your, your problem sparse enough, these are so rare that with a very high degree of chance, uh, you only have direct causal relationships ever present. And then your causal problem actually becomes a correlational problem, which if you think about this, it seems almost like cheating, right? And um, another reason for, for adding this, this penalty is that it breaks the equivalence of, or it actually breaks symmetry, right? If you, if you think in this case, th these solutions are technically equivalent. The moment you add, however, a penalty on the size of uh, uh, W12, um, it prefers one, one of these two uh, stories over the other, just the one where the correlation coefficient is smaller than the other. And so that, that means it, it will choose one over the other, but it, there, there's no guarantee that it will choose the, the right one over the wrong one, unless you have like some sort of prior assumption that generically you have smaller smaller weights preferred over, over larger weights in your, in, in your solution. Okay. Then here comes a big thing. So, so you, you want to, so this is like the, called the scope-based approach. So I have this, this loss, essentially, but what it essentially is, is a loss of your X minus XW, which is the thing that gives you your supposed causality. And you have the sparsity enforcer. And now you know that the thing you want to find is a causal graph. And the causal graph, as we said earlier, can't be cyclic. So you have to essentially try all DAGs, so, so the directed acyclic graphs, in order to find the right solution. And that's a bit of a problem, right? Because DAGs are discrete. And, and so you, um, Vahan actually gave two weeks ago a paper where they tried to solve the same problem in a different way by, by essentially sampling already from, from using a clever mathematical constructor to generate samples of W that, that specifically fall into the, these classes and which are then also parameterized. But um, in the original paper, actually, that the paper that this problem refers to, they don't use the L1 norm, they use the L0 norm, namely because they, they said they don't want to break that, that sort of symmetry um, by, by, by choosing one, one solution over the other. Um, and actually, it turns out that, that choosing lambda 1 has an impact also on, on because eventually you're going to threshold what what kind of solutions you're going to accept so so you're gonna you have a way of, of using uh, lambda one to tune what your false positive and, and false negative rates are uh, yes Bahan? hey sorry uh, how would they solve the problem with l0 norm isn't it untractable it is untractable yes so that's why in the original paper they only did it, i think for very very small graphs mm, yeah that makes sense thanks yeah, but, but yeah, the, the original small. paper never, never never claimed that they, they find anything but the, the uh, mark of equivalence class. Whereas this paper sort of doesn't, or they, they at least brushes under the, the, the carpet, which is fine. Um, what, one thing I also find quite cool, you, you can sort of extend it to generalized linear models, where your, your X, say, is, is a probability of sorts, and, and you have some, for, for example, probability, like, like almost like a logistic regression where you, 
uh, apply some uh, a monotonous uh, transformation to your data and, and and you can still solve it and that 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 is that still works and in, in the implementation of this algorithm there, there's a python package they actually have the option of of adding certain linker functions in there that make this still a a solvable problem now that was the issue right so so we are trying to optimize over a discrete space and that is that is generically a, a difficult problem now here they, they take one approach that is slightly different they say okay what happens if we could change this uh, penalty function or the, the, the scoring function in such a way that graphs that are acyclic get, get preferred over, over cyclical graphs. That sort of would mean that we could, we could solve this, this different loss without having, but, but our, our search space could be much more smooth. So we could, we could uh, solve that easier. And so they, I, I quite like this approach to, to make a list of things a list of demands is there are what such a function should look like and they say okay such a function should be adds should be adding zero penalty if the adjacency matrix is indeed acyclic and ideally you would like to have this function to be bigger if we are going away from from the acyclic condition because that means uh, that the whole thing we, we know whether we get closer to the true answer if we make h become smaller um, it should be smooth and then related to that is of course that it has derivatives and that they are relatively easy to compute and, and i think that is the main contribution actually of the paper is to find such a function that that fulfills all of these that can be easily computed um, and and sort of quantifies the diagonals and that in, in, in experiments and actually show that they, they can actually find dags by using a normal optimization now how could such a function look like um, in the first case, uh, let, let's assume we, we just have a discrete problem. We, we, we just say that that we have a, a matrix of adjacencies, and that matrix is either zero or one. So, so e either two nodes are adjacent or they are not, and um, the the diagonal of that matrix must be zero, namely because we, we, we don't want self adjacencies. And then they they, they show the theorem that the trace of the exponential of that matrix equals d, which is the dimension of the nodes or so the number of nodes. And um, I hope you're familiar with this matrix exponentials. They can be essentially, it's not, I don't think it's a Taylor expansion. I think it's called the Cayley expansion or something like that. But uh, uh, the, actually the, the definition of, of a matrix exponential is effectively an infinite sum of of, of matrix products with itself. And we want to take the trace of that. I want to see why, why should this become D if the whole thing is indeed a DAG? Well, the case K equals zero is, is simple, right? Because if you take any matrix to the zeroth power, you get the identity matrix of in that space. So in this case, it's a D-dimensional space. If you take the trace of that, you get the number of dimensions D. So we have already the, the, the first part, the, the trace E to the B is, is equal to D plus something else. Now we have to show that the something else should be zero. Um, if you look at the interpretation of, of B to the kth power, actually it is the count of all the paths of length K that loop back to the original node if you, if you, if you evaluate this function at the diagonal, so the ii case. That is essentially what the trace is doing, right? The trace is looking only at the diagonal elements of, of this uh, matrix. So if we know that the diagonal elements are the count of all the paths that go to that point, um, then, then them being zero would mean there is no path. And why is that the case? So, so imagine we have the case two by two matrix, then the um, one one element of the B square matrix is indeed B12, B21 which is exactly the one path that goes from one to the other. And because the, the matrix is, is positive, um, you can't have any paths canceling each other. So, so, so if you get a zero, it means there can't be a path rather than, than a path is having canceled. And that then in, in, in implies an if, if the BK trace is zero, that there are no cyclical paths at all of length K. And that then, of course, implies for the exponential 
because the exponential goes over all the different orders of k that there are no cyclical paths at all. Very kind of cool. Now, that was the binary case, but of course we don't necessarily look for uh, adjacency matrix that are either zero or one. And in fact, we also have the case that they can be negative, right? Because we know that there could be negative correlations or a, a negative causal effect between two, two nodes. So how do we get around that? They, well, if, for the proof that, that the case power of B um, is uh, the, the trace goes to zero, we didn't actually use the fact that B is, is one at all. We only used that to, to, for the interpretation of actual counting, but if we actually make use of the fact that B is, the, the elements are larger than zero so that there, there's no cancellation. So that implies actually, if we take our matrix W and take the Hadamard product with itself, which essentially is just squaring each element, we are guaranteed that, that W square is a matrix that had only positive elements. And so that then also implies that if we take the trace of that, uh, if, 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 sorry, if, if W is a DAG, so, so is W square, because a, a DAG essentially just is only defined by its zeros, right? And then it uh, gives the condition that if we take H as the trace of the square of the, or the Hadamard square of, of our adjacency matrix uh, and, and subtract D, then if W is indeed an DAG, the whole thing becomes zero. And what is also quite nice, yeah, the whole thing is differentiable and it can be relatively straightforward calculated. Now in practice, the, the difficulty is, is of course in, in calculating e to the power of anything for matrices. So that is that is actually where the, the, the brunt work of the algorithm comes in. And, and that scales to the number of nodes, but there are algorithms available that scale as d to the third power, which is where Rahan's paper actually comes in because they found a way that actually scales better by something from, from uh, good distributions by, by Bahan's paper actually outsped this particular implementation. Cool. Uh, any question at this point? That is, it doesn't make sense why this uh, function HW is indeed an indicator of, of, hey, of how acyclic a, a graph is. All good? Cool. Then now, now we come about to, to optimize this. And it's also not, not quite straightforward, but, but now it's a lot. So, so before, right, we had our finite space of the discrete space optimization. Now we actually add this additional constraint. And the, the problem, one of the problems of the, 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 the whole optimization problem by itself is non-convex now. So there is not necessarily a unique solution that can be found via a, a straight optimization. So they're, they're gonna be stationary points. However, oh, nowadays that's not, not a big scare anymore because pretty much all um, neural networks are just like that. So in practice, you can still have very good performance, even if it's an, uh, only a stationary solution. And the idea is to, to try to take this constraint problem of you know, where you say W has to, has to be close to zero or H of W has to be close to zero into a sequence of unconstrained problems and each one gets optimized separately. And then so essentially you constrain, optimize, constrain in a slightly different way or optimize your constraints and so on and so forth until you find a solution that is good enough. And then you threshold in order to take W to be completely uh, acyclical. And the, the objective function is being optimized is, is something like this. It's, uh, you have a function that depends on the weight matrix W and on alpha. Alpha is your Lagrange multiplier that essentially indicates how strong H of, of, of W acts on, 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 your, on your loss space. Now, it's, it's not really a, a, a meaningful constant, right? Because in the moment when you have a DAG then, and H of W is actually zero, then, then the actual value of alpha does, doesn't matter anymore. However, in the process of the optimization, that's not the case. So what you do is you 
you at each step you're trying to uh, optimize the, the Lagrange multiplier as well. And that, that one that one can be actually very big because uh, h is differentiable. You, you can actually do that uh, straightforward. And there's a, they actually have a theorem that if you start close enough at the, at the right a, a alpha zero, then that one also converges actually quite fast. So, so each con conversion step is actually relatively quickly done. How does it look? So, so you start with your with your matrix W zero and alpha zero, choose the tolerance beforehand and the threshold, and then you 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 go in, in dual steps. So, so first you optimize your uh, matrix to to the next step W t plus one. Uh, with, with some boundary on the on the, the row, so that you you are guaranteed to to get somewhere that is better than 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 we ended up with, so so that your diagonals gets also enforced as as you go along. And next step, you optimize your alpha, and you repeat this until at some point you actually uh, and and you 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 freeze out those uh, values that that drop below zero anyways, and eventually you're gonna end up with a matrix. Where you you are comfortable with the with the performance of the of the loss, and then you just set everything that is every every weights that are below a certain threshold to zero. And in practice, then you still test actually is this thing that comes out of it indeed acyclical. And in practice, that that, that works actually quite well. So so I I played around this implementation uh, for for relatively small problems, and after it it actually converges relatively fast, and the solutions that come out of it. Are indeed acyclical after the optimization, so that is, is really really nice. Um, yeah, as I said before, the exponentials are actually the expensive thing to calculate, so they actually use second order optimization problems, so that they converge fast and don't have to actually calculate this exponential uh, so often, just because it's, it takes time. Um, yeah, they use the proximal quasi Newton method for the for the unconstrained problems. I don't know enough about it to to say whether that is anything special or not, but, but some experts here might, might know better. And because it's- a, a okay, I can problem. add some information about this. Say again? Okay, I can maybe help. Uh, yeah, please. Proximal means usually when you have a sum of two parts, so you have a, the general, uh, like these squares, right? You have the convex part and then and the non-convex or convex but non-differentiable part, yeah. which you can, uh, which it has a nice structure. Right? In this case, L0 norm has a nice structure. L1 norm has a nice structure. Mm -hmm. uh, Quasi Newton is the Newton method, is a version of Newton method, which is in second order method. So yeah. you take the uh, second order gradient and invert it to get the next step, except yeah. you don't invert it, but you do it approximately. Yes. Okay. That's, that's, that's the idea. Yeah. yeah. And because normally the, the, the second order methods, are actually in, in, in neural network optimization also not that commonly used because it's typically also quite expensive to, to calculate uh, the the Hessians, right? But here, because it's a smaller problem, it's not, not so much of a problem, I would think. And and then actually yeah, no, normally if you if you can do one second order iteration, mm -hmm. if you can invert Hessian once then it's the best method because you could usually converge after a few iterations. Yeah. But I, I, yeah. I mean, most problems you can't do it. That's true. I, I think there are even some, some special class of problems where in, in principle you can get in a single step to the right answer if, if the problem yeah, is- Yeah, quadratic problems, right? If it's quadratic, you yeah. invert the Hessian, then you get the solution in one step. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and in practice, actually they, they also, because it's, it's a sparse problem, W is supposed to be sparse, uh, they, 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 they make use of that. And, and only actually then keep track eventually of, of all the, the values that are non-zero, which, which makes calculations a bit faster. Um, and at, at the end, so, so H of W never goes actually to be zero, but, but close enough. And then and when you threshold the Ws, you, you get zero case out of it uh, most of the time. The good thing is it's something you can test, right? Once you, ha once you have a, a candidate, you can test whether they are acyclical by, by, by applying it and, and you should get exact zeros out. Um, yeah, I, I would again. Here's my, my my thoughts. I think because you use L1 regularization, L1 typically actually 
it's, it's not an ideal solution, right? So I, L1 tends to be quite aggressive. It's, it's mostly used for finding the, the best, uh, the, the, the subset of features that is important. So I, I would almost think that, that once you have a structure, W set, uh, optimizing against using an maybe L2 norm uh, regularization might be actually better in case you, you are interested in the actual values of these uh, optimization uh, of these W coefficients. But um, if, if you're only interested in what is the potential structure that probably can be discarded. Now let's come to some experiments. That is, that is actually also quite interesting. So they, they, they sample graphs from these adders any and these scale free um, random graphs. And I don't remember actually what these were. I, I looked it up because I did it two, years, two weeks ago. Now I've forgotten. I think adders only was, was completely random uh, uh, choice between two graphs, uh, between two nodes, um, like, like you have a probability. Otherwise uh, not in the, the scale free, I think was, was building up graphs. And then they generated data. So, so essentially, I didn't write this here. The X this is a random graph. Then you apply this random graph to the weight matrix that you have already created, and you can create new data. Yes, Peter. Um, one thing before that is like a, an element of their algorithm, which is a post-processing step, is thresholding. And one statement they made in the paper that I thought was really interesting. It says, um, like intuitively, it makes sense, but I'm like, how do you prove this? It says. It is known that post-processing estimates of coefficients via hard thresholding provably reduce, re reduces the number of false discoveries. And I was thinking to myself, I mean, I guess the point is that if, if there isn't an edge or if there shouldn't be one, then the number is going to be so low that, I don't, yeah, I was just thinking to myself, I wonder how, how you, how you. Um, I mean, the, the more you special, you, you, you can't possibly increase the number of false edges, right? Because you're only taking it away. Yeah, so. It's it's I I think yeah just just saying that you know uh, be, be 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 skeptical about your, your findings and, and if you if you prune them out you you're likely generalizing better. It's a fa false discoveries. What would be a false discovery like? Well, that, that's 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 a good question, right? So, so when you when you essentially find a correlation that is not really there. Mm -hmm. Now this is where where it gets but. Bit, bit tricky, right? So, so they generated the data according to this process. So they took random numbers, applied the adjacency matrix, and and get get new data out. But we know already that this relationship is actually only the consistency, but it's not the generating data, right? So if you have a graph that is deeper than 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 one parent generation, if you apply a random number to it, so 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 you only get correlations between data points, but you don't actually, in a single step, you lose correlations between parents and their, their grandchildren. And of course, if you don't, if you don't have them even in your generated data, because your generated data is, is, is almost by definition only a, a single uh, step process, then I would think that you, you, you probably also wouldn't find these, these sort of uh, relationships in data, so that's why I think actually they they probably underestimated their their false discovery rate just by creating synthetic data that that artificially doesn't have grandparent relationships in there, and that is that, that I think is, is is a bit of a, of a uh, pinch of salt when it has to take all of these findings here. And um, they played around with different noise distributions, and theoretically they, they shouldn't make a difference according to some papers, and in practice they they, they made very little difference as, at least provided you have enough data. Yeah, and that's why I said it's the, the data generated is, I don't think it's, it's causal data, it's it's correlational data that's being generated, which which makes this a bit, hmm. yeah. Um, how does it look in, in practice? So, so the, the upper left data is the, the true graph that they generated, which is a DAG. And if you look at the first to the right, this is the data that is the, the structure that has been found by, by, by training. Um, under no constraints. So, so this is the completely unconstrained problem. And if you just compare them, they look quite quite similar. I, I found that the this, for example, the uh, eleven zero element. This is like this light blue. This actually has been, I think, switched to the other side. Um, so, so I, I think that that shows where where you would think that that light elements, uh, some some elements might be actually mirrored to the other side. 
um, because the, the graph essentially has to, to choose one of two options. And, and so it, it, it can flip around a bit. Now, when you add, uh, the, sorry, the upper row is actually the, the case where you have a lot of data. And in that case, um, the, yeah, the, the, the structure it found seems, seems quite reasonable. Adding, adding a bit of sparsity actually seems to be making it worse by, by adding the L1 constraint. And they, they compared it against another algorithm, FGS algorithm, which I think is, is only binary, whether there is a link or not. And by just looking at it, it seems that their solution is, is, is definitely better than, than the other. Again, under the constraint that the, the graph itself might not, or the simulated data might not be as, 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 as yeah, as appreciative of, of the real random graph as, as it should be. On the bottom is, is the other case where they used um, it's the same graph, I think, but with uh, only 20 data points. So, so, so a lot less data points in, for which you can find the, the structure. And there the unconstrained problem, yeah, essentially went completely bonkers and I think gave, gave quite, quite useless results. And here, actually, adding a bit of uh, regularization helped to, to at least recover some of the, the, the relationships quite nicely. Um, again, I'm, I'm actually still a bit confused why regularization actually finds these, these very strong relationships. And then adding the regularization should actually prefer the, 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 the weaker ones. But um, yeah, not quite sure. And the, the other like the, the competitor again didn't didn't find too many meaningful relationships i think either in this particular set if one looks however the metrics of how good they perform um it, the, the picture becomes a bit a bit, bit different so actually in, in the, the main paper they, they put mostly the uh, false discovery rate and the structural hemming distance as, as metrics and it turns out their algorithm actually seems to be outperforming the other algorithm on these metrics less so actually in the true positive rate. In the true positive rate, there were cases where the other algorithm was actually a bit better. And so, but they put that in the appendix, which is less likely to be read. So uh, generically, you can imagine if, if, if you make more nodes into your problem, you would, you would expect on average that your, that your, that your error goes, goes up. But at least in this case, the, the node here's error, the, the structural hemming distance seems to be growing at a slower space pace than, than for the other methods. So, so it seems to be stronger. But it also depends a little bit on the um, graph that you're trying to find uh, underneath. And the same with this, uh, false discovery rates where the noise seems to be relatively, or the, the, the kind of noise seems to be not so really important in, in, in what, the, what the outcome is. It's, it's really going to be more the actual graph structure, whether like whether it's this, this other friend you or the um, uh, what was scale free graph is, which, which makes uh, the, the curves different essentially. Um, I think that was all I wanted to say about this. Yeah, then they, they talk a bit about the threshold, right? So thresholding is free, still a free parameter of, of how, yeah, at, at what point you, you want to consider your, your, the, the values you get out of your, your algorithm to be valid points or not. And so they, they, they played around with it. And when you, when you do that, you can naturally create your, your true positive and, and false positive rates, and you can create rock curves. And naturally, the, the better algorithm would get the, 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 the bigger AUC curve. And here, did you just play around with the different values of, um, of uh, yeah. Of the, of the the underlying graph structure, and, but also the the number of data points, so which is energy is the signal to noise ratio, right? And and they, they see that yeah, there, there is a, a, a rock curve, so there, there's a room for tuning your results to be more false positively or, or more or higher precision, higher recall. And but I think they didn't compare against other algorithms because the other algorithms often didn't have this choice of, of thresholding. And lastly, they become, ah, sorry, not lastly, actually just one more step. They actually then looked at the problem purely from a optimization procedure. 
how good actually are the solutions? Because if, if your graph is small enough, you can actually find the direct uh, solution by just trying all combinations. It becomes very quickly very, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, complex or expensive to calculate, but for small ones, you can test it. And they actually showed it in many cases, especially for, for a higher uh, count, number of counts, their, their, the solution they found is actually quite close to the optimum solution. So even though it's a non-convex optimization, the solutions generally seem to be quite good, which, which, is, which is a very good uh, thing to know, which means that you might be able to use this algorithm outside of just causal structure finding, but also for other problems where you need uh, quality of results to be good. And, and lastly, they tried measuring against real data where you have a data set is uh, almost 10,000 uh, observations and on 20 edges. What I found quite interesting that they compared against this FGS algorithm and they, they measured as, uh, as, um, yeah, as, as, as metric the structural hemming distance, essentially how, essentially it's, it's a count measure of, of how many things they got wrong compared to how they got right. And the, the structural hemming distance was in both cases 22, which means they, they had 22 different uh, observations, uh, different assignments and then the experts would have said because this is a data set where experts provide structural information of what they think are the correct causal results. And actually that means that just random guessing that there are no causal relationship would have given you, I think a better structural hemming distance than any of the, the causal structure finding algorithms. Um, of course, it is not very useful, but uh, just shows what, how difficult this is as a, as a problem. And what would have been quite nice if they would have uh, calculated the, the rock curves for this, this real life experiment and, and so that we would get a feeling of actually how close were their findings to the true findings rather than uh, the, the, these raw numbers. Yeah, and this is actually, brings me to the end. So it's this no tiers algorithm is, is, is a algorithm to find structure and data by itself is cool. And the, the, I think the, the big contribution is this smooth function that can help you find uh, Dagnus in a, in a, in a, yeah, how to say, in, in, a, in, a, in a structural manner so that you can actually, you have like a recipe for, for finding a DAG using a, a score, which is quite useful. And you can differentiate it, so that's really nice. Um, the the optimization procedure itself is, is quite good. They have shown that that the the results they get are quite close to the the global optima, at least on the small problems. So one would expect that also for larger uh, systems, this is probably true. And yeah, one one has to be a bit careful with this causal structure that is being found to interpret it directly as a causal structure. And I think Wahan also did in in his paper, right? That the, the authors, they actually were, were quite explicit in saying that the direction of the causal the structure that's being found is not necessarily true and one shouldn't take it as at face value, which makes sense because uh, you, you only end up actually in, in this Markov equivalence class, which, which might or might not uh, be the, the, the right direction. So it's almost like a coin flip. Um, yeah. And I, I do think that, that some of the variations on the synthetic data are flawed just because the way the data was generated in the first place does not truly follow the causal uh, assumptions that are going into these structural equations. And so, so one also has to take these into a, with, with a grain of salt and that the false positive rate might be underestimated just because uh, causal relations, uh, not called the correlational relationships between nodes and their grandparents are essentially ignored in the data or they just don't, don't appear in the data. But in practice, I would imagine that if you apply such an algorithm, there's a chance that, that it would also find um, parental uh, grandparental relationship. And it's un unless there, there is some sparsity in force, there's not a good reason why one should be better than the other. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Any other questions? One thing I was thinking is that um, I think a hard assumption of the me entire method is that uh, there's essentially like a, a linear relationship between variables with outed noise, which is like the SEM mm -hmm. equations. And I was wondering, 
how strong of an assumption do you think that is with respect to, to real world data? So um, for example, maybe they didn't do the thresholding curves for real world data because the SEM assumption is not very good in that case. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in, in if, if, if you would say that, that linear equations wouldn't work, then I think half of economic research kind of <laughs> would break down, right? So, so I, I, I think for, for many problems, actually it's not too bad of an assumption, at least locally, right? So, 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 so most um, continuous problems do allow for, for Taylor expansion of some sort. So, so you would almost expect that at least in, in some region across your, your manifold, it's, it's approximately linear. So if you, if you center your data properly, it might work with caveats. Of course, in, in, in practice, if you if you have very far outliers that it might then, then then throw your problem off, you might get very, very unreasonable results. Mm -hmm. However, I didn't actually add it here, but this this problem also you can apply it to to this GLM data, right? So so where your where you where your function classes is uh, generically linear, however, you have some uh, linker function that, that might move it into a Poisson space or into some other space. And so then, then it becomes actually relatively uh, generic, I, I, I would think. But, but yeah, of course, in, in practice, we know that there are in, in biophysics uh, thresholding. We know there is there, there, there are binary stable states. So, so that, you know, I think the, the, the best assumption is, is, or the best example is, is food, right? So, so people say that actors, who, who become fat for a role should think twice because our, our metabolism seems to have this, this binary instability that, that the moment you get fat once, it's much, much harder to, to, to drop back because, because your metabolism essentially has, has shifted into the different state. And, and such a thing is, is a very, very common structure in all sorts of biology problems, uh, like, like protein activations. And so that of course is, is, is so very nonlinear that it might as well be not useful. Thanks. Anything else? I guess not. Um, yeah, this was a great presentation and a really cool paper. I, I always hope to find papers like this where I feel that they're pretty accessible, um, even if you don't have like a big background in the in in the in the topic. Um, so. I, I really liked how they how they motivated their their their, their cyclicity and, and you know it's it's something taking a matrix apart and thinking about the individual steps it's, it's definitely possible and teaches you something about matrices as well yeah um i'm gonna stop recording